Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. In this episode, we talk about uh, different art forms of the 30s. We do American regional regionalism, um, American idealism, we'll talk about the movies, and then we'll do the Soviets. And so, what do we have? American regionalism emphasizes people cast off by nature and society. That's the grapes of wrath. That's all of our pictures and paintings here, from the Nighthawks to American Gothic. These are the people left behind, which makes sense because that's what the 30s were. The overwhelming feeling of the 30s is we are left behind. But what they all show or attempt to show is dignity that these people are left behind by the economy. They might be left behind by the jazz age and the urbanization of America, by the wealth of uh, Wall Street. But it's the attempt to show dignity. We see this especially in the Grapes of Wrath. But there's also a melancholy, a melancholy for something that's lost, a dignity that's lost. A, a something, some kind of American ideal that, that no, you can't put your finger on it in, in any of these paintings, in the Nighthawks, in American Gothic. There's a melancholy to it. The photograph of our coal miners, there's dignity. But you look at that and go, I don't want to live like any of these people. And yet there's something lost in all of them. The Nighthawks especially. The idea that there's four people in an empty street in a city or a small, small city. Large town, small city. And none of them are talking to each other. They're not engaged in the boisterous drinking conversations, music of the Jazz Age. That everything about it is dark and still and quiet and a, a little bit lost. There's the endemic inequality of urban versus rural America. This is the Daring to Look by Dorothea Lange. It's the opposite of the Jacob Reese Other Half Lives which was centered on urban poverty. Now, when Jacob Rees does his book, The Other Half Lives, he takes his camera into the slums, the ghettos, the tenements of New York, and he's showing middle class and rich people, look at how the poor people, look at how immigrants live in cities, in these slums, in these ghettos. But there was the idea that out in the countryside was the small town farmer with dignity and work. And they didn't have all the stuff that the big f fancy folks in the city, the avocado toast of the city, but everybody in the, in the countryside was doing okay. Not rich, not fancy, but okay. Perfectly fine. And what these paintings, what these photographs start showing is just how much richer urban America was versus rural America. And it's an issue that's right up till, till now. The 2016 election broke down on urban versus rural divide. That, and there were plenty of think pieces about the anger of rural America to vote for Trump is as much against the wealth of urban America, the culture of urban America, the values of urban America, as it is about the person they voted for. And so what happens is the government supports art. We already kind of discussed this in the welfare state. Uh, the government supported the regional arts, but did not direct it. They didn't go to Eugene. They go, went to Eugene O'Neill and said, here's money, write something. They didn't go to Eugene O'Neill and say, write something awesome about Franklin Roosevelt. Whereas the Nazi and the Soviet systems 
are, the Soviet system, as we'll discuss, is owned, directed, controlled by the government. And the Nazi system, the, the fascist system, is there's so much wealth for particular types of art that what the artists do is simply buy into it. And so, you know, if you're a sculptor and the only one paying money for sculptures are Nazis who only will pay for sculptures of Nazis, what are you going to do? You're going to make sculptures of Nazis, whether you're a Nazi or not. That's kind of how the fascist system worked. Whereas the Soviet system would say, you're a sculptor. You are going to make Soviet sculptures, whether you want to or not. And you said, aye, aye, Capitan. So what about American escapism? This is the other part of the 30s. And you can see how, how different this is compared to the three pictures we had before. The bright colors of the Wizard of Oz. The red, the fire, the passion, the love. The sensuousness of Gone with the Wind. And the sheer spectacle of King Kong. American escapism, and this is going to be especially in movies, is an escape from the Depression. And then later on, this is going to work in the 40s too, the war. This is, it's all about reminding Americans you're not in the Depression for an hour, for two hours, for three hours. I mean, that's the Wizard of Oz in a nutshell. The first, what, 25%, 30% of the movie is Depression, Kansas. And then, whoo, coat of color, coat of chrome, Oz. Where teenage girls with ruby slippers can change the world. That's to remind you, you're, just, you're not in the Depression. Because when you walked into the movie theater, you were in the Depression. When you walk out of the movie theater, you're back in the Depression. But for those, for a nickel, for a dime, for two hours, you can escape. And movies, especially radio as well, but especially movies, because you do it in the dark. You go into a room that's dark. They turn off the, the, the lights and you're alone. And it's just you and a 60 foot screen. So it just could be you. Whereas a radio is in your living room. You can't escape your own poverty. And so what themes we got is prosperity. That's gone with the wind. Man, she starts rich. The Yankees burn shit down. She gets rich again. They burn it down. She gets rich a third time. She's always, you know, Brett's coming in, getting rich. It's prosperity. Look at this. Look at the dresses in the beginning. Look at the, the houses. Tara. Tara is the only thing worth anything. It's a big, giant house and thousand acres of land or however many acres of land it is it's prosperity for people who had nothing nothing and no hope of anything which is the part you have to remember of the about the depression about the 30s is there's not even there's no hope there's not like oh i'll get a job in a week there are no jobs there is nothing and so to watch and look at what is insane exteriors, crazy interiors, lush, the woods, the dresses, the color. They're in color. You didn't photograph in color. It was way too expensive. And here's this three-hour, four-hour movie in color. It blows your mind. Prosperity. Honesty. Of course, and this is in Young Mr. Lincoln, there's going to be an emphasis on honesty. Why? Because someone was dishonest and they led the, us into this disaster. They led us into the war. They led us into um, the credit in the jazz age and all the decadence. And then they led Wall Street, led us. They said, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. And it's not. And so... American escapism is about emphasizing honesty. Washington, 
Lincoln, these characters from history who are honest, who you couldn't impugn. Because politicians today suck. They're all liars. They're all off for themselves. Wall Street doesn't want to help you. Wall Street doesn't want to help America. It wants to get rich and get out. It screwed you. It left disasters. The banks don't care. Notice later on with... Um, it's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart is like... The honest man in town, There's, they, they have the evil banker who's just like, I'm going to make all the money. I'm going to make all the money. I'm going to change town and make all the money. I don't care. He's capitalism. Whereas Jimmy Stewart loses money by being honest. And he's the hero of the town. Yay. Isn't that nice? Frank Capra and honesty. He's rewarded because the town believes in him. He's never going to make money, but he's the honest leader of the town. G. Williger shucks. He has the respect of the townsfolk. But that's what people wanted because they, they didn't want the evil banker. They saw the evil banker who was foreclosing on their homes, foreclosing on their farms, who was closing the factory, cutting their wages but not cutting his own. And what they wanted was just someone to be honest honest with them. The movies also emphasize action, money, independence. These are the gangster movies. These are the most famous gangster movies. Jimmy Cagney is exemplifies this. In the 20s, he's a dancer. He's a jazz man. He's a, he's a Broadway sing, song, dance man. By the 30s, He's a gangster. He's the gangster. Scarface, Serpico, the, uh, uh, the Sopranos, every gangster movie made since, they're all trying to be James Cagney, Jimmy Cagney. He so embodies that, but that's not who he was. Not as a person, not even as an actor. It's like taking Neil Patrick Harris off of Broadway and making him Scarface with a giant machine gun and a drug lord in Miami. And people going, yeah, that's awesome. That's how much things had transferred, transformed. That the singer, songwriter, and I was writing, singer, dancer, Broadway show, man, musical man of the 20s. Those movies don't exist anymore. The movies of the 30s, he comes into and he becomes top of the world, Ma, the gangster who fights the system because the system is up against you. It's like all of the guys in the gang in the wire. It's Omar as well in the wire. These guys who fight the system, but the system wins. The gangster can't win because in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, 50s, crime can't pay. Not till the late 60s are movies willing to say, well, maybe we'll have an anti-hero. Maybe, anti maybe they'll get away with it. Maybe the bank robbers do win in the end. The, the American escapism still had, to, had people didn't want gangsters to win. They didn't want to replace evil bankers with gangsters. They wanted the gangsters to lose, but they wanted them to beat the system for a little while so they could live vicariously through that. That brings us to Soviet realism. So American escapism is trying to escape the Depression while Soviet realism is showing how we act. We have survived. We have come through the revolution, and we are successful. So we're going to have realism plus symbolic representation of values. What does that mean? Well, take a look at our picture on the video. We have two men, one with the welding goggles, one he's got an apron on, he's the working man, he's got his sleeves rolled up, and he's got the hammer and sickle near him, the symbol of industrial union between the industrial and the rural workers, and he's holding the giant red flag of communist revolution. 
And next to him is a dude with a beard and wheat. Just wheat. Just popped out wheat. Why would there be wheat? That's not the realistic part. The realistic, that's the symbolic part because it's saying he's the farmer. But they look like people. They look like men. You could probably have walked into the model and looked at him and said, oh, I've seen you in the poster. And yet, there's all these symbols. The red of the flag of revolution. The hammer and the sickle. The wheat. The things showing this union between industrial worker and rural worker without having to say, I am an industrial worker. The fact that the rural guy has a bigger beard while the industrial urban city guy has the more modern mustache. He doesn't have, he's clean shaven on his cheeks. So what these symbols are supposed to represent are family, emancipation, emancipation from capitalism, strength, and especially collective unity, where Jimmy Cagney is about the individual fighting the system and almost winning. Soviet realism is about the collective. We are better together because communism is about the collective. We are better together. The individual sacrifices for the, for the success of the group. We also get female inclusion and equality. The women are working. The women in our two new pictures of art, one is in an industrial factory, which I can't really identify. And the other picture painting is uh, of women uh, shucking grain of, of um, with shovels and moving it from one place to the other. That women did hard labor. Women worked. Women were equal. Women were valuable. And the idea, overwhelming, was people are happy. Stalin is great. And communism equaled freedom. Freedom from capitalism. Because communism got to, got to say, look at, the, look at the mess that is going on in Europe, in America. They talk about how capitalism is great. Look at them. We're successful. You have a job here. You're making money here. We're making awesome stuff here. Capitalism is dead over there. Ah, capitalism has imploded. And so communism is freedom from all of that oppression, from all of that disaster in Europe. What does this mean? It means there was a lot of money for graphic design. There's a lot of money in the system and lots of graphic design. They're always, they're going to make the output of Soviet um, artists explodes in the 30s. It's massive in the 30s. Now, you can go, hey, that's propaganda, and I won't argue with you, but the idea is that the artists are creating art in order to emphasize the success of the state, to remind people how awesome society is that you live in. And so there's lots of graphic design, but there's little freedom for great artists. In fact, most great artists will leave in the 20s and the early 30s. They'll go to Europe, they'll go to Switzerland, they'll go to France, they'll go to Paris. They'll leave because there's no freedom to make art. You got graphic design, but not art. Now, I know if you're a graphic designer, you're going to go, wait a minute, I do art. But I don't mean to insult your artistic voyeur. What I'm saying is the art of the opera, of the 30-foot painting, of the that's not what they're creating. What's being poured out is graphic design advertisement art the art of the magazine this is not Stravinsky doing a uh, 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 a crushing new ballet he's going to take that he's going to write down in Western Europe he's going to write down in Switzerland it is the art it is graphic design it's just smaller not that it's not good it is. It's very good. It has an entire system around it. Museums have shown this stuff. But it's not Picasso either. If 
because there's little freedom for great artists to actually do the great art, to come up with their own stuff on their own. They had to do the people are happy, Stalin is great, and communism equals freedom. And that's not necessarily what great artists wanted to do. So what are our results? Our results are the relationship between the individual and government have completely changed. So this is the results of the 30s. The relationships between the individual and the government have completely changed. Fascism, the individual sacrifices for the collective. I give so that the collective wins. Where communism was the individual gains from the collective. I am better because everybody does better in communism. Whereas fascism says, I will give so that the group succeeds. Or more likely, the group says, you must give. The state becomes the most important thing. It drives culture. It drives art. It's driving economics. It's driving marriage and work. The state, whether in communism, fascism, or even in the welfare state, in Western liberalism, is increasingly involved in your everyday life in a way it wasn't before. Both fascism and communism are at war with the world. Fascism sees imperialism, the conquest of other places, to destroy degenerate systems, both capitalism and communism, and to make space for the superior victors. It is Darwinism. I will eat the weak and survive and thrive. Whereas communism is a defensive war to destroy capitalism. We have to fight capitalism because capitalism wants to destroy us. And in doing so, we will create a worldwide utopia for workers. Additionally, Stalin is at war with anyone who isn't Stalin. So there's that problem going on. So that's the world that we're in. Whereas fascism and communism. Meanwhile, Western liberalism is just trying to hold on. To maintain as much as it can. To, to change around the edges. So it's, it's taking a little bit of this, and it's taking a little bit of that. Um, it takes a lot from communism, the way Bernie Sanders does. Uh, that's going to get us socialism. Uh, because you can, you can afford things if, you col if you're collective. And so we're going to get Social Security, and we're going to get welfare, and we're going to get food for poor children, and we're going to include these things because the idea was you had to give something. Capitalism had to change some way. Otherwise, you're going to have a communist revolution. And so Western liberalism is stuck in the middle, trying not to change that much, and yet being forced to change by the sheer gravity of the end of the economic political systems that happened from 1929 to 1933. So, all right. In our next episode, we do the 40s. So, it's going to be terrible, but good luck. Bye.